Good afternoon and welcome back to the first tactics board of the Ben Napper era. Norwich City are finally back in action after the international break when they face QPR at Carrow Road and David Wagner will be in charge for that one. A lot of people didn't expect him to be in the home dugout but it looks like he will be after a tumultuous period ended with a 3-2 win over Cardiff in the last championship game. Of course a little while since then so there is still a level of unpredictability about this game and a lot to find out about how Wagner will set up his team but I'm going to attempt to give you a predicted starting 11 and tell you how the game will pan out tactically. Of course QPR very much struggling 23rd in the championship but Marty Cifuentes has seen a pretty decent start to life at Loftus Road so I'm going to give you a little bit of information about how he tries to get them to play as well and how that might play into Norwich's hands and how it might hurt Norwich as well. So without further ado, this is the team I expect Wagner to start for that QPR game. So I've gone with George Long in goal, Jack Stacey at right back, Shane Duffy and Danny Bart at centre back with Demetrius Yunulis at left back, Gabriel Sarra and Kenny McLean in the centre of midfield, Christian Fasnacht on the right, Jonathan Rowe on the left with Ashley Barnes slightly behind Adam Eder up front. And I've gone with George Long in goal just based on fitness reasons really. I think as soon as Gunn is absolutely ready um, he'll be in the team but of course he missed the international break with Scotland and the noises we're hearing sound a little bit like he's maybe slightly behind in terms of his return um, compared to where, say, Ashley Barnes is. So it might take a couple of games for him to get back into the mix, bearing in mind, of course, the next game after this QPR one is on Tuesday. Um, so only a three day break. So we might see George Long for a couple more games. And although I don't think that's overwhelmingly good news. I think he's had sort of a, a mixed start to life at Norwich. Maybe he should have made some, some slightly better saves, but no howling errors. I think his distribution has been pretty average, to be honest with you. So for a backup goalkeeper that cost the club nothing and saved them money in comparison to the wages that Tim Krul was on, I think he could be worse. However, Wagner will be keen to get Gunn back as soon as possible and it doesn't look like he'll have to wait long. I've gone for Jack Stacey at right back purely because of that performance at Cardiff, of course. Wagner started Kellen Fisher and Chemislav Poheta on the flanks and it didn't go especially well in the first half, hence the substitutions for Stacey and Yanoulis, um at half-time. And both of those, I thought, were pretty impressive. Hopefully, that was the wake-up call that Stacey needed. He's now been dropped twice in favour of Fisher um, because I think his performances over the last couple of months, to be honest, haven't really been where they need to be. And yes, throughout this run, you can point to the injuries, the lack of... Barnes and Sargent and even Marcelino Nunez and, and some others and you can point at Wagner and his failings as well tactically but I think there are certain players who have also let their players their, their form sorry slip. Um, I think Stacey is one of them, Yanoulis has been one of them, Gabri Sara as well is one of them, Shane Duffy of course and we'll come on to them in a second but I think Stacey has really seen quite a significant drop off from that very, very promising start. I think a lot of the times when I was asking fans what they thought of the new signings, the name that kept cropping up was Jack Stacey and they were really pleased with him. You look at the age profile as well and he really was panning out to be one of the most impressive signings that Norwich made this summer. But he struggled in the last few weeks and hopefully this is a, a chance to show that he's sort of back to his best because he did look pretty decent against Cardiff and of course the result means that the evidence was there. So I expect to see Wagner put him back in the team. I also expect to see Shane Duffy come back in. It's not necessarily the 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 choice that I would make um, or the move that I would employ, but we know how important experience is to Wagner. I don't think Jaden Warner had an especially good game at Cardiff, to be honest. And Duffy has been a significant favourite of Wagner's, of course, only missed that Cardiff game through suspension and has started every other game um, in the league. So yeah, it seems pretty unlikely to me that he's he's left on the bench again, although a lot of people have been pretty pleased with, with Warner's performances. And of course, when you're coming off the back of a win, it is harder to make those changes. But Wagner's team selections have been as erratic as I've seen, I think, from any coach. So it is quite hard to predict, but I do think he will throw Shane Duffy in there and keep Danny Bart in alongside him. I think after that performance at Cardiff, easily one of the best players in that Norwich team and probably the only one who... Came out of that first half looking pretty good and probably because he had to do a lot of defending. 
his teammates left a lot of defending for him to do and he did quite a lot of it despite Cardiff scoring two goals in that first half of course but I think he impressed me enough and hopefully he impressed Wagner enough to secure a starting berth so I've got him in a left centre back at left back I've got Dimitris Yanoulis and obviously I spoke about him when we discussed the Jack Stacey situation and it's a very similar one although I thought he was even better than Stacey in that Cardiff game of course a key role in the winning goal um, may may have been offside but it was a very tight one and just technically one of the best players that Norwich have I think he he needs to step up really and I think he's uh, he's been speaking about sort of the battle for a, a first team place with Greece as well Costa Simicas the Liverpool fullback um, is currently beating him to that left back berth so hopefully ahead of the Euros um, Yanoulis can try and win that position back off him and can find that motivation to then go and produce for Norwich because he was excellent in that second half against Cardiff and I think that will earn him his position back in the team. In midfield I've got Gabriel Sara and Kenny McLean and when things have been going well, when things have been going badly that's been one of the absolute constants in Wagner's team and if he doesn't want a defensive midfielder, which all along we've been told he doesn't, those two are the two natural options. Of course Jakob Sorensen now looks like he could be involved in an, another pretty significant injury layoff. Uh, Marcelino Nunez doesn't really play that role especially well. He's not really physical enough. Adam Forshaw out injured as well, of course. So not really many options. And Kenny McLean and Gabriel Sarra are two of Norwich City's better players. I mentioned um, there before, obviously, that Sarra needs to, to probably improve his level. And even Chris Sutton in his column said that he wants to see more on the physical side from the Brazilian. So I think there is room for improvement in both, especially Sarah, who can go and be the best player in the championship for me if he can reach his, his best levels um, on a significant, on a consistent basis, sorry. Um, but he's been struggling to do that in recent weeks. I thought second half against Cardiff, he was fairly decent. And even in poor performances, I've, I've seen opposition fans and reporters saying how impressive he's been. So clearly the ceiling is very, very high on him, but we need to see some consistency and we need to see some performances pretty soon because I don't think he's been regularly reaching that level that he was at the start of the season. On the right, I've gone for Christian Fastnacht, who I actually thought had a really rough um, sort of half an hour or maybe a bit less than that before he scored the opening goal against Cardiff. Of course, a tap in from one yard out and that I think galvanised him a little bit for the game going forward. Of course, another one who started the season really, really strongly. One of a number, I suppose I could have included him in that list of players who shouldn't have allowed their levels to drop. But he certainly has until that Cardiff game when after a certain period, he seemed to really wake up. Obviously scored that goal, played a significant hand in the equalising goal. He was the last Norwich player to touch it before the own, own goal from Ryan Wintle. So... Clearly a player that we know has a lot of talent and can perform at this level. But again, it's about finding that consistency. And given how much Wagner trusts him and believes in him, of course, he was the driving force behind um, being the only player that, that Norwich spent money on for the first team this summer. So clearly he rates him very, very highly. And I think when he performs well, Wagner will always give him the opportunity. So I expect to see him on the right, on the left, Jonathan Rowe. I've gone with tentatively, given the injury situation, there were probably three in there um, that you could argue might not be there. Of course, Long is one based on the gun situation. I've got Jonathan Rowe in there and Ashley Barnes, who I'll come on to. But Rowe returned from England international duty early, but from what we're led to believe, they're hopeful that he can be involved in this QPR game. Doesn't look like an especially severe one. It was actually one that he was sort of dealing with for the last three or four weeks with sort of injections and just playing through it. So hopefully not an especially significant one, but clearly one where there was enough concern caused to bring him back to Colney early. So it does feel a little bit touch and go. Of course, we'll have an update from David Wagner at his press conference later today. So keep your eyes locked to Pink and Channels for that. But for now, I'm tentatively going with him in there because if he is fit, of course he starts. And then up front, Barnes and Eder, I think... That probably is the biggest gamble I've taken with my predicted 11. Of course, Huang Yujo started that game against Cardiff and I don't think looked especially poor. But Adam Ida comes on, scores the winner. You could see what a big moment that was for him. And I think without Sargent and Barnes, he's done OK. Um, probably could have gone better, could have gone worse. But he scored three goals, which compared to probably where Norwich are in the championship table and the chances that he's been, gi he's been given is a pretty average performance. Um, but I think that goal, again, it's this moment of, oh, is it now Adamida's time? But you're hoping that that goal 
can go and galvanise him um, for the future. And Wagner will certainly hope so. So I've gone for him in the team. And then Barnes. Wagner has tended to be quite tentative with the, the sort of injury situation. And given Barnes is 33, you'd you'd maybe think that he would be in this situation as well. But this is where I'm just throwing in a wild card and saying that you can never totally predict Wagner's 11s. We know how much faith and trust he had in Barnes at the start of the season before that knee injury he sustained against Leicester, of course. And I just, I, I think I may as well throw it in there, hopefully add a little bit of optimism. And I think this is one of a number of things that are going to fall into Wagner's favour in the next few weeks. So the excuses are falling away. Now he's got these key players coming back and... Um, yeah, I think he can offer a, an element of calm that probably has been missing in Norwich City's um, performances if he approaches it in the right way. Of course, he's got the experience, he's got the mentality, and although that has got the best of him at times, I remember at Rotherham seeing him just barge consistently into a defender with clear frustration, but if he can channel that in the right way and act as a leader, get his teammates on the same page, he can be a significant asset to Norwich sort of mentally and also tactically and technically. He's obviously a very good player at this level as well. So I'm just going to guess that he might be in the team and then we'll see come Saturday at 2pm. Just wanted to touch quickly on some of the elements that QPR um, employ in games. They've gone with a 4-3-3 since Marty Sifuentes arrived at the club. That's the formation he's used throughout his career. And I think something they struggle with is pace. They've still got Steve Cook at centre-back, who, of course, is very experienced and technically a good defender, good timing. But if you can get the other side of him, he's probably not catching up with you. And then the likes of Jack Colback in midfield. It's a very experienced um, 11, but they've, they've probably taken that that approach that Norwich took in the transfer window one step further. They've really looked at the same weaknesses and tried to target the same things, but probably don't have the financial power that even Norwich have in their current current financial struggles and they don't have the pool that Norwich have in terms of size of club in the championship and their prospects of getting promoted so it's just a, a slight level lower of that experienced um, group and I think they struggle for pace a little bit so if Norwich can move the ball quickly which admittedly they've struggled with in the attack in recent weeks they haven't been quite so dangerous on the counter attack or played it through the thirds as quickly but if they can do that they will really expose QPR but an area where QPR probably can hurt Norwich is Sifuentes likes to exploit the gap between fullback and centre back. And this is actually a, a pretty inventive and pretty clever setup that you don't see very often. But what he does is overloads the back post when a wing is in possession of the ball. So what that does is basically drags so the fullback obviously marks the winger and then it drags everyone else who's available to mark over to the back post to deal with those players. And then one one midfielder gets left loose, ideally, to go and exploit that gap between the fullback that's forced to go out and, and mark the winger and all the players over on the other side. It's actually quite clever and not something that I'd really heard of until I started researching this QPR team and Marty Sifuentes and his career. So if he can employ that against Norwich, it's actually going to be a very dangerous tactic, of course, with how far up their fullbacks are, with the sort of pace struggles that their centre-backs have at times coming across to cover as well, that could definitely be where, where they hurt Norwich. So that's something they'll have to be careful of, perhaps something the midfielders will have to cover for in terms of stopping those players charging through those gaps, maybe helping cover those gaps as well. But if they can do that, it should be a pretty decent chance for Norwich of winning this game. And that's almost where all the pressure comes from. Yes, they've got a win against Cardiff. And if you look at it on the positive side, it would be two wins on the spin, which would be hugely refre refreshing, sorry, and the first time that they had done that since the end of August. So there is an opportunity for Wagner to establish some momentum for the first time in a real long while. But unfortunately, if they don't win, the pressure is massively going to be on him because that international break was the best chance Norwich have from now until the end of the season to get rid of their head coach and have time to replace him. So... If things don't go well with Wagner from now on, they've left themselves open to that criticism. Of course, there was the, the problem of the sporting director ch changeover. And I do understand that Napa wants time to assess Wagner and work with him before making a decision on his future. But they have left themselves open to that criticism. And Wagner is under immense pressure to win at home against the 23rd placed side in the league on Saturday. We'll see how he does. Keep it locked to Pink and Channels, of course. Plenty of preview and afters to come on uh, this YouTube channel 
and on pinkin.com um, where you can go to pinkin.com forward slash subscribe to get the first two months for one ninety nine and then two ninety nine. Thereafter, very good value if you ask me. As always, very biased, but uh, you can give it give it a try yourself for just one ninety nine for the first two months. Loads of exclusive columns, interviews, analysis, etc. I think you'll enjoy it. So go over there and give it a try. For now, thank you for joining me on Tactics Board, and I'll see you here again very soon.